It was a tense scene in the city of Culiacan, Mexico, as a group of officers surrounded a home with their weapons drawn. And that tension was more than justified, as the officers were soon to become part of history, taking down one of the most notorious criminals in the region, a man named Ovidio Guzman Lopez, the son of Joaquin Guzman, also known as El Chapo. There he is, the man known as El Chapo, finally back in custody after 13 years on the run since bribing his way out of prison. Despite his father having been arrested back in 2014, Ovidio was still a free man, continuing his father's legacy by taking a lead role in the cartel. But this day... Anything with the cartel, reading about it always scares you. That is no joke. And I'll remember the scene from Breaking Bad. I mean, all the stuff I've read over time, but I'll never forget that scene. I'll try not to spoil it for anybody who hasn't seen Breaking Bad. I suggest you see it. Something happens, basically, there, uh, like a murder, we'll just say. And uh, it was pretty brutal. It was pretty brutal. And um, one of the detectives who used to be in the U.S., you know, the whole time now working there, witnessed it, saw it, and, you know, kind of like threw up and was just like, and uh, it was pretty graphic. Yeah, the tortoise. Next. You know what I'm talking about. The best way to get the cartel to not off you is to say this. Goku would be disappointed in you. I don't want to ever talk to the cartel. I don't want to ever piss them off. I want nothing to do with them. As officers prepared to enter the home and detain Ovidio, the sting itself was supposedly set up by the Mexican government as a way to halt the cartel's reign over the region. And for the cops partaking in this daring moment, they were set to be heroes should it all go off without a hitch. In that day, that's exactly what would happen. As Ovidio was taken into custody and the scene was secured, wow. without a single shot being fired, wow. making what should have been a huge win for the Mexican government. Absolutely. Had the story ended there. Oh, of course it's not gonna end there. The city of Culiacan, Mexico, the historic homeland to the violent Sinaloa drug cartel, turned into a battle zone Thursday. The city quickly became a war zone, oh, with man. the cartel sending over 700 armed soldiers in retaliation against the arrest of Ovidio, all despite the fact that officers had actually made Ovidio call off any such actions by the cartel, as shown in the end of this body cam. They ain't gonna listen. They're gonna think that he's um, held captive and forced to say that, which, you know, he is, they ain't gonna, they ain't gonna back off. The Mexican government would make a shocking decision to allow Ovidio Guzman to walk free. The move was stunning, though it did immediately quell the fighting in the region, and for a moment, all seemed calm. Though in the minds of the cartel members, things were nowhere near even. They let him walk, I, yeah, better than a war, yeah. Oh my God, that's like, that's a really tough decision, but that's like being, you know when they say someone's untouchable? That's almost someone who is untouchable. Which brings us back to this video. In it, we see multiple officers taking part in the operation, with the leader of it all being a man named Eduardo. And though these officers likely thought that their actions that day would make them heroes, this decision would instead make them hunted. Just days after the botched arrest, Eduardo would be stalked and confronted by armed members of the cartel, who would open fire in a hailstorm of bullets when the man was in his car. In total, 155 shots were fired at Eduardo, who never stood a chance. Oh my god. You know, that's always been why I, I have a lot of support for police officers, firefighters, military, and everything. This this point, I'm talking about police officers. I've always been nervous. Like, I, I've never, I don't think, um, I, I would have never been a cop. I was never interested in being a cop. I have the utmost respect for cops. But, man, I always wondered, say I was, like, I'm, I'm out there to catch the bad guys, right? And I have a family and things like that. You know, these cops, man, you got to wonder when they're doing the right thing and they're tracking down someone or putting someone behind bars like that. That guy who gets put behind bars, even if it's, like, a, a murderer or a criminal, they got to be thinking the entire time the person that took them down and the revenge factor, any chance they get to take it back to that person. If you're that cop, man, I'd be, I feel like you're always looking over your, you'd be always looking over your back. I mean, with your aim in games, thank God, f*** you. 
but nobody really talks about that. Everybody talks about like you know, which is which is scary for a cop to go. Even just a, a regular traffic stop is super scary for any cop. You never know what you're going to encounter. But the repercussions after you lock someone out uh, up, or maybe you were a detective on a main case and you finally got someone, who knows who they have on the outside that'll track you down to try to. Scary stuff. And the horrors of this video don't end there. As despite Eduardo being the only officially confirmed death of all of these officers, it has been heavily rumored that in the time since the recording, every single one of the officers seen in this clip have since been killed, as they became the cartel's easiest form of revenge against the police, being picked off one by one to send a message to the whole world. Oh my God. And watching this clip back and seeing just how calm Ovidio was during his arrest, I have to believe that he knew that this was going to happen. And though he was the one being arrested, it really seemed like it was the police that had fallen into his trap, making this yet another example of the disturbed content found across the depths of YouTube. Depths in which today we are yet again diving into oh, as we boy. look to discover more of YouTube's darkest videos. <laughs> What an intro! <laughs> to all my friends, I'm glad you came to play. Barney? The only thing that is great engraved in my head with Barney is, I don't know why it creeped me out, but I remember a song in Barney. Not the I love you, you love me. We're a happy family with a great big hug and a kiss from me to you. Won't you say you love me too? Not that. It was the cookie jar song. Let's say a name like uh, John took the cookie from the cookie jar who me yes you couldn't be then who dun, 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 dun. Stacy took the cookie from the cook I don't know why but as a kid when I heard that cookie jar song just like when we covered when I saw my first pair of boobs I ran I did a lot of running away from things my whole entire life I heard that song and I remember I ran. Since its inception, YouTube has been used as a launching ground for aspiring performers to have their work noticed by the masses. But for every success story you see across the site, there are hundreds of thousands of others who will land well short of achieving Next. fame. Is this one of you won't collab with Skull? Her booba scares Guys, you? Guys, I'm not scared of booba now, bro. It was, it was a want to relax. It's so a one-time thing. I, I, I didn't want to get in trouble. And I was a kid. I didn't, know what was, I, I didn't know what was going on. Lost in the crowd of these nameless faces was an aspiring rapper named Math Boy Fly. Math His Boy real Fly. name is Daryl Brooks, a now 39-year-old man who had spent most of his life on the wrong side of the law. At the age of just 17, he would pick up his first felony for battery, and from there, he would never really get his life back on track, picking up fresh charges on a regular basis. By 2007, Daryl's life was in a total freefall, as he had become addicted to meth while uh. picking up his most serious conviction yet for rape against a minor, which not only landed him in prison, but it also landed him on the sex offender registry. Clearly, Daryl was a disturbed man, dealing with some Jesus. extremely dark personal demons, which just so happened to be captured by a film crew who at the time were documenting the struggles of meth addiction. The movie's name is Crystal Darkness, and in it, we see a short segment showing Daryl in prison, sharing how he had abandoned his kid due to his addiction, while expressing regret that he couldn't give his child a better life. Bro, meth, meth is one of the worst, meth and heroin. I mean, they're both equally bad. And, and the worst part is when, with some people who do want to get clean and get off it, it's really, it's the withdrawals. That, that suck them back in, because literally your whole body is just, it's, it feels like you're dying. It's bad, it's terrible stuff. You know, I got this, I got this beautiful kid who's, who's going without my time. I, I thought I would just be this wonderful father, this, just be the greatest dad ever. I'm gonna give him everything that I didn't have. But then it's like, reality set in. In an interview years later, the director of the project, a man named Logan Needham, described Daryl as seemingly genuine in his pursuit to turn his life around, stating, I felt like he definitely had remorse, and I think he felt bad about the decisions he had made to land him where he was. However, Daryl would never turn this new leaf, and once he was released, his dangerous behavior only got worse. I can't believe he was re Oh my god. Some of the, uh, I... I'm not a lawyer and I'm not a, you know, uh, I'm not pretty keen on the law, but man, I, I do believe people could change. I do. I truly do believe that. I've seen it happen, um, depending on how severe. 
right? But then there are some things that are just uh, addiction is a whole different process. That's not that's that's something that just takes hold of you, man. As time and time again, he would find himself back behind bars, facing charges like strangulation, domestic abuse, and bail jumping. Oh my God. Though he didn't let these endless legal troubles get in the way of his one true dream, a dream that he believed would finally bring him some semblance of success in this world, with that being to become a famous rapper. And so he took on the nickname Math Boy Fly and began posting his music to YouTube, where we find what would one day become one of the darkest videos on the site. Oh man. We're gonna get the video? Rap video? I just got a low worth about a half a ticket. 30 in the blinker when I'm out here chasing chicken was observing to the game when I used to play the bench. Name's Dick Petty. It's no Twinkie Cat. Yeah, I'm a cat, but it doesn't really matter though. I can't believe I remember the lyrics. The video was posted back in the summer of 2018 and featured Daryl's song, Half a Ticket. The video features a lot of your standard music video visuals, though ultimately nothing really stands out all that much upon True. first viewing, aside from how bad it sounds. <laughs> but Someone had to say it. Someone had to say it. This clip is viewed in a far different manner. Around the time of its release, something was brewing inside of Daryl. His life was at a dead end and he knew it, leading to his violent temper growing worse and worse by the day. In 2020, Daryl would be arrested for firing a shot at his nephew during an argument. And though the bullet thankfully missed the man, Daryl would still be faced with 10 years in prison. Police discovered that the gun he had used was actually stolen, along with a large amount of meth being found in Daryl's pocket, which all cultivated into the prospect of a lengthy prison sentence. Absolutely. Though due to issues with the pandemic, Daryl would eventually be allowed to leave police custody, as his bail had been reduced to just $500. Unsurprisingly, this would further enable Daryl's behavior, and the following year, he would yet again be arrested. In this particular case, Daryl had been in his car stalking his ex-girlfriend, who was also the mother of his child. This is why I hate the system. At times, it's, it's one thing, right? If someone messes up, whatever their crime may be, right? They serve, you know, time out on good behavior and they look like they're trying to change their ways. But when you got someone constantly getting locked up back and forth, bail, in and out, I don't understand how you could keep letting them back out. It's a whole different scenario. If someone messes up, right, and it's like a first offense and I get it, you know, and, you know, they're, you're a little bit more lenient. But, like, for repeat offenders constantly, and it happens a lot, going in and out of the system is just terrible. Before pulling up alongside her and demanding that she get in, concerned for her safety, the woman refused to enter the car, to which Daryl reacted by running her over. Thankfully, this woman too would survive the ordeal, though shockingly, despite Daryl's constant run-ins with the law, as well as this crime having taken place when he was literally already on bail, he would yet again avoid jail time, as his bail was, in this case, set at just $1,000. I don't know what to say to that. You're opening up, you're opening up, you're also opening up a can of worms and you get, uh, cause you know, people would be like, well actually in the justice system, like at least we could all agree whether whatever side you're on of the justice system that you're figuring this and that, whatever the case may be, we could all agree that it sucks and it needs fixing. It's not right. Things need to be changed. Free again, Daryl likely began to think that he was above the law, which paired with his escalating anger would unsurprisingly lead to one more violent outburst. Though what was surprising was just how violent it would be. On November 21st, 2021, days after Daryl's most recent arrest, police would be called to the home of his ex-girlfriend as they had yet again gotten into another dispute. But this time, before things had gotten too far out of hand, Daryl stormed out, got into his car, and drove away. Though rather than this being some sign of restraint, this was instead seemingly part of a far more malicious decision, leading to one devastating event. <laughs> Oh, God. 
Oh my god, now it's all come back to me. I remember this. It's this. I know. I thought this. It's this where he drove into the whole parade. Oh, I remember this. Oh, wow. All right, a few of you, same as me, were like, wait, it's this? That day, oh. Daryl Brooks would drive his car directly into the annual Waukesha Christmas Parade at speeds of over 40 miles per hour, driving in a zigzag pattern in an attempt to strike as many people as oh. possible, none of whom Daryl had known personally, as this was simply an act of pure rage. The videos of this event and its aftermath are brutal, and it's something that I'm not allowed to fully show here. But in total, 62 people were struck, most of whom were children or senior citizens who were just trying to enjoy this beloved community celebration. And of these victims, sadly, six would perish. God, Following the tragedy, Daryl attempted to flee the area, even begging a stranger to let him into his home and to order him an Uber, which would be caught on a Ring doorbell camera, though he would quickly be captured by police soon after and is now facing a whopping 77 charges. And despite the leniency he's enjoyed from the court system over the years, it seems that this time, the judge will not show him that same type of mercy. But that's the thing that it took drastic measures like that. Next. Disgusting. This guy also went viral because he wanted to represent himself in court for this case. It went crazy online because of how chaotic and unruly it was. Wait. He was so infuriating to watch. You just reminded me, is that, oh my god, is that where he was going crazy the entire time interrupting? Oh my god, I think I've watched like the whole thing. He was constantly interrupting and like for like the whole time, like constantly. The five wildest outbursts. Here, here, here. We'll just take a. Once again, you're doing like this. this. Tactic. Because try to it, it's not a tactic. Off it's facts. It's facts. This. To some other reason. It's facts. Because I, I find it hard to believe that. Um, I'm gonna all let of the a state... sudden nobody hears what I say. I'm gonna let the state oh, make stop. a record of why they stop. believe it's objectionable because I haven't let them do that. We go over the top five outbursts. I'm not gonna watch this whole thing. We get back to the video, but let's let's go and watch them. The standard's not prejudicial. The standard's whether it's unfairly prejudicial. It's but unfairly you can open the door Your to Honor, that, sir. It's unfairly president, uh, uh, prejudicial that I have a, a, a document stating that November 20th never even happened, but yet and still the witness you, can get on the stand and lie on the stand. over to the state? Come on, man. Y'all know that's not right. Um, Y'all know that's not right. Oh, man. Then you need to immediately turn it over to the state right now. It may become relevant, but no one has seen it. When so, did you receive the so document? So Hold on. When did you, when, gonna, I'm having you make an offer, but when did you receive the okay, document? Okay, but that, I just want to stay for the record, Your Honor, that that's that's kind of biased because the the state did the same thing yesterday. Well, this goes on for quite a bit, but I just wanted to show a little bit of that there. I remember I watched a long time ago. I did watch a lot of it. I remember there was one. He really got pissed, bro. Next. You want to go see. Chat, don't be like Daryl Brooks. Get a lawyer. You think you know the law. You barely know the English language. You're not Robert Kardashian. You're a new inmate. Yep, and this will always, uh, I've said this to this group over here, YouTube. I've said this to them. We went over, um, uh, we had a, a day where I went over uh, stuff with them too. Rule number one, I love our police officers. I, I do, I, I do. Uh, I got a lot of Don't ever talk to a cop. Keep your mouth shut and get a lawyer. You have no idea what you could say to incriminate yourself, even if you have nothing, if you've done nothing wrong or not even associated with the problem. Don't. They're not there to be your friend when you get pulled into an interrogation room. You have the right to remain silent. Do not talk. Knowing what Daryl has become and watching this documentary back with this context makes it a truly haunting watch as no one involved, not even Daryl himself, knew just how bad things would one day become. But there is a reason that I mention this seemingly obscure music video as being one of the darkest videos on the site. I, I don't know what it could be. I was trying to figure it out with this video. I'm guessing it's the car. <laughs> I just got a low worth about a half a ticket. Yeah. As Daryl is shown rapping in the video, within its background, we can see a red SUV. Next! The same SUV. Man had a shitty rap career and decided to make it everyone's problem. For real. 
Our next video takes us all the way around the world to a little-known village in northeastern Somalia called Halam. In October of 2021, a video from the region began circulating across the web, uh -huh. showcasing what appears to be an unremarkable scene playing out. Seeing that that image, this uh, right here, seeing this uh, this image, man, there was a time, I guess, because like uh, I'm, I'm a little bit older, but for any other millennials there or around my age, you know, that time, you know, you're like 28, 29, etc. You were probably in this. There was a time period on the internet, a lot of gore videos and things. And one of them was a lot of beheading of journalists and stuff. And I don't know what it was uh, growing up. Like, ver now, I don't want to see any of that. Like, I don't want to look at it. I could stomach it, sure, but I don't. But there was something about, I guess, growing up with the internet. I don't know what it was, but I saw them all the time. And, like, I, I would I would be like, yo, let me see, like, another one. It wasn't like I was like, wow, I want to see. It was just like, oh, my God. But there was something about it where I was like, I got to watch. And I'd be like, oh, my God be an unremarkable scene playing out as two men from the village were being interviewed separately. As one of the men is seen talking, a few individuals appear behind him, working as if they were preparing for some sort of event or perhaps just doing some farming. Given the language barrier and a lack of translation included, it's impossible to tell what these men are discussing upon an initial watch. And given just how normal it all seems, it offers little reason to be dove into any further, had it not been for two bizarre details. For starters, the thumbnail is quite unusual, as it shows a man yeah. who is not featured within the video, tied up and clearly looking upset while one of the men who is being interviewed is shown standing proudly alongside him. Making things even stranger, the title, which is written in Somali, translates to the fairly disturbing line, Garo, the killer of his mother, was shot dead today. Despite things appearing unremarkable in the video itself, the thumbnail and the title alone were enough to pique the interest of a select few who just so happened to stumble upon this practically unknown upload. And those who chose to dig any deeper would be greeted with the true horrors of the scene playing out before them. Upon performing a general Google search of the video's title, users will be greeted with a plethora of uploads featuring footage of the same event, one of which even showing footage of the man in the blue shirt tied up with his head down. You saw the actual video on YouTube? Yeah, and also, there used to be, uh, back in the early YouTube days, before they started cracking down, you used to get some pretty rough stuff on YouTube. And the results didn't stop there, as searching the title would also lead to the discovery of a multitude of articles that also depict this very event that we see unfolding, which would ultimately add clarity to the situation, as it was revealed that this bound man shown in the footage and the thumbnail was actually a cold-blooded killer. His name is Farah Abdi Mohammed, and during that previous summer, he had apparently fallen into what was described as a drug-fueled rage, which would ultimately end with him taking the life of his very own mother. And making matters even more tragic, he was one of seven siblings, meaning that six other individuals had lost their mother thanks to this man's disturbed behavior. The case went unnoticed by most outside media outlets, though within this small village, it sent ripples across the community, as his crime was so heinous and his guilt was unquestionable. And with Farah quickly landing in custody, the question was then posed, what do we do with him now? Would prison really be enough of a punishment for this individual, or should he face the death penalty? That's a touchy, touchy spot, because there's a part of me um, I'll just give it to you straight what I think. Um, there's a part of me that, um, you know, I, I'm, I'm a Catholic. I'm I, not bringing religion or any of this. That's, you know, I don't do politics. I don't do religion. You believe whatever you want. You do your own research with that. I'm an entertainer. I have no right to tell you what to believe in or, or whatnot. My job is to make you laugh. But a, as a Catholic, I believe, like, I, I shouldn't have any right to tell a man when they die or, like, control another man's life or woman, you know, sentence them to death. 
So I, I kind of don't believe it, but there's a part of me that you do something like that, you kill your mom or child or something like that, you deserve you deserve to f die. Ultimately, authorities would leave this decision to the remaining siblings of Farah, who would be tasked with determining his fate. And it was from these discussions that Farah's brother, a man named Awai, would come forward with the decision that Farah should suffer the same fate as their mother did, and that he should face execution. Though this wasn't all Awai had to say, as his decision came with a interesting proposal. He wanted to make a spectacle of the execution and send a message all across the region that those who take the lives of their mothers will have their own lives taken in return. Oh. And so, to assure that this was seen by the masses and to prove just oh, how serious Awai display. was with his message, he would request to be the executioner. You know, so and like, October like it's crazy. I think it, I I learned about this recently. I, well, I don't know how it's true, but you know, they used to do the public executions, right? With the gauntlet, you know, the uh, guillotine. I mean, and you know, a variety of things like that. But it's it's so they say when they would behead someone, right, in front of the audience and the crowd, and they'd hold the head up in front of the crowd. I don't know how true this is, but it wasn't to like you know. It wasn't to like show the crowd or anything. It was because of uh, the consciousness st stays for like eight seconds, and it's just to show, uh, well, the person you know who committed the crime that's beheaded could see uh, the entire crowd in front of them. What has happened? November seventeenth, two thousand twenty-one. News cameras gathered in the town as Awai was interviewed in preparation to take the life of his own brother and the killer of his mother, as he's seen here even posing alongside Farah just moments before the execution. The situation is almost impossibly grim, and to make things just that much darker, those men seen working in the background of a wise interview were in fact helping to set up for the event, or at least the aftermath of it, as in actuality, they were quite literally digging Farah's grave. They looked like they were digging a grave. That's what I thought from the beginning. Right behind his own brother, with Farah watching it all happen just off camera. And so, in the moments following this footage, Awai was handed a gun, which he would press against the head of his brother Farah, and pull the trigger. Damn. The layers to this clip are almost incomprehensible, especially considering how calm everyone seems in the minutes leading to this execution. I mean, even Farah, whose life was soon to end, seemed to show no panic whatsoever, despite his grave literally being dug right before his eyes yet no one seemed to show any sort of emotion. It's almost like everyone understood their roles and accepted what needed to be done, leading to this one unconventional, yet almost indescribably disturbing video. That's why I always I, I always think it's crazy too, you know, if someone decides, you know, death by firing squad, I think I brought this up last time, you know, they have one bullet in there where someone's actually shooting the bullet and the other seven people have a blank. So you don't genuinely know who actually shot the bullet when, you know, you have a death by firing squad. Imagine they all miss. Well, they, they're all blanks, except one is real. So they can't all miss. 90% of them are gonna miss. February 13th, 2014. God, so a man named Kevin Bennett approaches a busy intersection on his way to work in the city of Hampton, Missouri. The morning commute had gone just like any other. Typical traffic, fair weather, and on the corner of the intersection, a man was dancing. He was a well-known figure in the area, or at least his performances were, as virtually every morning he would be there, not saying a word, not begging for money, just simply dancing. Like many others, Kevin found the man to be... I had a, I had a dude every time I'd go to work. Every day he was there. Uh, I was playing baseball. There were quite a few times where I actually commentated. I shoutcast the game. It would be like long fly ball, hit deep to left, back, 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 gone, a home run. I whisper it, obviously I'm not gonna draw attention. Cracked out of his mind, like clockwork. This man though apparently isn't cracked out and he's just dancing, doesn't want money or anything. I decided to film that morning's performance and post it to YouTube for others to see. Hey, this guy's good. The video was met with over 10,000 views and even led to a mention in the local news reports, as collectively the community wanted to know who exactly this man was. 
No one knew it then, but this man's name is actually Seth Herder, and what they were witnessing wasn't some type of light-hearted dance routine but rather the deterioration of a man's mind, Aww. which was playing out in real time. Hi everyone, my name's Seth Herter. At the time, Aww. Seth was an unemployed man in his late 20s who had been struggling with multiple psychological conditions, leading to his behavior becoming somewhat erratic as time passed. This was cataloged throughout his frequent postings across the web, Aww. where he would type bizarre religious ramblings claiming that Jesus would soon be returning to Earth alongside intergalactic beings. But sifting through countless posts of this same vein, Seth actually mentioned his daily dance routine on a few separate occasions, referring to it not just as a performance, but also as some sort of religious ritual that he was using to spread his message. And though this message was never expressly stated, most would assume that it was based around the idea of peace, as he would often say things like, I love all beings forever, and seek never to kill, nor harm, nor destroy any living thing, no tree, nor bird, nor bee, nor dragonfly. I, uh, we didn't get to the end, I don't know what happens, but the way it seems, he seems he wouldn't hurt anybody. And he's fighting through it each day. However, as time passed, he would slowly drift away from this particular belief. Well, right on cue. Throughout much of Seth's adult life, he struggled to hold down consistent residency, being evicted time and time again for things such as noise complaints and heavy smoking. And by 2018, Seth had again found himself moving into a brand new apartment. And it was within those walls that his behavior would take a troubling turn. Almost immediately, neighbors in his complex began complaining about Seth's behavior, stating that he had been seen multiple times running down the hallway over and over again with a katana in his hand. Even more bizarrely, others claimed to have seen him standing behind the apartment building, alone in the dead of night, standing there in complete darkness, brandishing his sword and just dancing, alone in the dark, for hours and hours on end with him appearing to be in some sort of trance-like state, completely unresponsive to the world around him. And his behavior didn't stop there. He's a weeb. That's your first thing to say. The man has a sword dancing in the back alley, and the first thing you guys say is he's a weeb? Are you fucking kidding me, bro? Seemingly out of the blue, Holy Seth began verbally harassing his neighbors and starting fights over seemingly nothing at all, where he was said to have displayed a genuine and even frightening anger that seemed to be growing more and more uncontrollable. Though it's hard to say for sure what exactly was on Seth's mind during this time, as he had abandoned all of his social media in the years prior, leaving what had once been his daily blog and his Twitter account completely dormant, and practically stopping his trail across the entire internet. With the exception of one site. As for whatever reason, Seth seemed to take a liking to one unique platform during all of this, with that site being Amazon. Seth was an avid reviewer across Amazon, leaving his thoughts on the various religious texts and tokens that he had purchased prior to the height of his manic episode. Oh man, I may have left two comments on all the stuff I bought on Amazon. I read a lot of them. It has to be either really, really good for me to leave something or really, really bad for me to leave something. Which is all fine and well, but starting in 2018, his purchases and reviews began to grow worrisome. For instance, in March of that year, Seth had purchased and reviewed a pair of industrial strength metal handcuffs, which he reviewed by saying, strong metal, good case, be careful. On another occasion, he had purchased a set of knives, throwing blades, and his katana. Throwing blades and the katana, you're right, he's a weeb. Used multiple times across his apartment building, referring to the sword as amazing, stating that, for $20, it really is an excellent blade. I am very impressed with the quality. The tip was razor sharp and easily capable of penetrating most targets I put it up against. Once again, a great purchase for $20, very capable of killing. It is a fighting blade for sure. The post was also accompanied by a photo of himself with the weapon in his hand. 
There are some definite red flags here in his reviews, but the most disturbing example of all would come just a month later, as Seth would describe his experience with a specific taser that he had purchased by saying, I bought this exact stun gun model. In a fit of rage, I shocked myself in the face and neck about 30 times with the units. It left visible welts on my chest and neck. The stun gun is effective. It has a loud audible snap that really goes straight to the dark parts of someone's psyche. It really is a potent psychological defense weapon. He then followed up this post by saying that shocking himself was exhilarating to say the least. The items in which Seth had been purchasing and the subsequent reviews he had left for them were clearly very concerning. But for those who knew him personally, things were actually becoming even more frightening. As around this time, Seth would call his father to explain that Jesus had spoken to him and had selected him to carry out certain tasks claiming that he was the chosen one and that it was time to start punishing people. I'll Sp never understand that. I know it's a mental health disorder, so there's there's obviously no comprehension. You learn about Jesus doing good like your whole life, and when someone, even in, uh, you know, at their late age, as they're getting older, you know, they turn Jesus. I could never just picture like, Jesus, of all you've learned from the Bible, from everything, if you are a Catholic or whatever the case, Jesus telling you to kill. But again... There's schizophrenia, there's dementia, there's and, and there is no right or wrong. It's whatever's being played in the head. Father would immediately contact authorities as he was unsure of what his son's intentions were, though nothing would be done about it, leaving the door wide open for Seth's punishments to begin. On the evening of May 2nd, 2018, Seth invited his ex-boyfriend, Christopher, to his apartment, begging the man to come over and claiming that the CIA was listening to his thoughts. And sensing that Seth was clearly in need of help, Christopher agreed to stop by, a decision that would ultimately backfire, as once together, the two quickly began to argue, leading to an all-out shouting match that soon turned physical. And in a fit of rage, Seth would grab his katana and in an instant, begin attacking, slicing Christopher over and over and over again. And as it turns out, Seth's review was in fact accurate, and his katana was certainly capable of killing. The scene would be discovered days later, when maintenance workers were confronted with the carnage in the unit, while on the ground was Christopher's lifeless body. Oh. Despite an attempt to flee, Seth Herter was caught soon after inflicting this punishment and later claimed that it was all done in a fit of delusion. With Christopher having unfortunately been caught in this crossfire, with more victims likely to have followed had it not been for his capture, has given his need to inflict pain onto the world, as well as the concerning items that he had purchased throughout Amazon. Who knows what else he was capable Jeez. of. Oh my god. It's pretty jarring seeing this man who was once known for his cheerful dancing becoming a convicted killer who will likely never see the outside of a prison again. But throughout the whole case, there's still one question that looms over everything. The dancing. Why did he do it? What was the message behind it all? Well, this would actually be answered by Seth himself what? during an interview in late 2018, as following his heinous crime, he stated how he believed he was the chosen one, hand selected by God, but not as some second coming of Jesus or anything like that, but rather, he believed he was the Antichrist, a figure chosen to bring pain and suffering onto the world. And with this mindset, Seth referred to his dancing by saying, that was me going out in public and demonstrating to people that I was the Antichrist. Next. Little bro, the Antichrist isn't gonna wield a katana like a fucking weeb. Riches of his glory, say that with me. He grants me. Today was going to be a big day for me. It was my first the trip Turpin away family. from home. Uh, okay. It was a day of celebration for David Turpin and his wife Louise, another in a long line of wedding anniversaries that they'd celebrate by renewing their vows in Vegas. And to make the moment even more special, they were able to do so with their 13 children in attendance. When they first married all the way back in 1985, David was just a 23-year-old man, and Louise was a 16-year-old child. 
and despite what? all the years that had passed, it seemed the love they had for each other was still very much blossoming, as they renewed their vows to each other in this same manner practically every year, as shown in other clips. What? clips scattered across YouTube. <laughs> and aside from the love they had for each other, these videos also seem uh. to show the love they had for their children. As together, the group seemed to form a massive yet close-knit family unit, known as the Turpin family. And these clips would be just the start of their long trail left here on YouTube. Sometime following these various clips being left across the internet, one of the daughters shown within this old footage would begin uploading videos of her own life to a secret channel that at the time only she knew of. The then 17 year old's name is Jordan Turpin and across her page she would post videos of herself singing original songs in her bedroom. But it's over, it's over, it's over. While showing incredibly brief glimpses into her home life, And as a whole, these videos seem nothing too out of the ordinary, yep. especially for a 17-year-old girl, with her uploads eventually coming to an end following There's, there's the probably so many videos like this of just kids goofing off singing, acting stupid. We all did it there. I'm getting nervous. I'm, what, what, why, is it, why is this going to be the creepy part? Is she going to get murdered or something? Posting of yet another singing video. And throughout the channel's lifespan, I, it's really literally, literally what she's doing is all of TikTok. There are no obvious red flags that could point to any concerning activity happening behind the scenes. As aside from a few moments here and there, Jordan never. Is that a squirrel hat? It's a My Little Pony hat. Chibi, you could confirm. Is that a is that a My Little Pony hat? Rainbow Dash, you motherfucker, say her name. Well, I guess it's a My Little Pony hat. Okay, okay. All right, it's a My Little Pony hat. We've gotten confirmation from the brony. Don't ask them who their favorite pony is. Don't answer that, guys. You do not have to answer. She only used the page for her music, making it practically impossible to tell that in reality, something unbelievably sinister was transpiring within the walls of the Turpin home, with it having gone unnoticed for years before and what would have likely been years later had it not been for the actions of Jordan. As just one week after her final upload, a call would be made to 911 from the young lady herself. This is 911, do you have an emergency? Uh, I just went away from home because I live in a family of 15. We have a goosing oh. parents. Did you hear that? They hit us, they throw us across, they like to throw us across the room. They pull our hair, they, they yank out our hair. My two little sisters right now are chained up. Oh my god. In this clip, we hear the audio from Jordan's call to the local police station as she attempts to explain that her parents had not only been abusing her, but all of her siblings as well. Given the severity of the claim, an officer would immediately be sent to meet with Jordan, who had been standing outside in a nearby neighborhood, with the entire interaction being captured on the officer's body camera. What's going on? Okay. I just ran away from home. Okay. And I live in a family of 15. Okay. My two little sisters right now are chained up. They're chained up? Yes. Where are they chained up at? On their bed. They're chained up because they stole mother's food. Okay. But they stole it because they were hungry. Jordan explains God, to the officer bro. that two of her siblings were currently chained to their beds, all because they had attempted to steal some Next. of their mother's food. The real crime is the dad's bowl cut. Makes Nags's hair look great in comparison. Even more shockingly, Jordan explains that her nervous and oftentimes awkward behavior was due to the fact that she had never really met anyone from the outside world. Uh, you know, her 911 call that we heard kind of uh, rubbed me the wrong way a little weird not from like a scary point of view but seemed like lying she's like did you hear that I, I don't know it just felt weird but it's making sense if she has like never really been out sorry if i talk too much i've never talked to anybody out there so i don't I d i've never been alone with the person so this is very hard for me to talk and that in order for her to get help, she literally had to escape from her own home, as she was never allowed to leave. And the reason I managed to get out here, this is one of the most scariest things I've ever done. Uh -huh. I'm terrified. 
Initially, the officer was a bit hesitant, mm -hmm. even questioning whether Jordan was on medication, yeah. to which yeah. she responded in a confused manner, due to the fact that she had never even heard that word before. Do you take any medication? What's the medication? Medication? Yeah, what's the medication? Do you take pills? Do you take pills? And ultimately, the man eventually realizes just how serious the situation yeah, was. Yeah, bro, she doesn't know Jordan any of that. Maybe she really is kept in. Jordan actually came with proof. I don't have proof of everything, but I have proof that my sisters are chained up. Look at that. See, those are the places that make an omen. And see how dirty she is? We're so filthy. We, we, we don't take baths. We don't. How did your sisters get like this? Your parents yeah, chained them up? Yes. The whole ordeal was shocking, though it was only part of the story. As when police entered the home that very night, they discovered the full scope of the abuse that had been taking place within that building. Inside, officers would be greeted with the overwhelming scent of excrement oh, and garbage. Oh my god. Which, oh, they really were, Captain. That's so crazy. Which was covering practically the entirety of the house. They would also find 12 other siblings, one of whom had been chained up for weeks, and two others that had just recently been freed. The children were malnourished beyond belief, oh and God. incredibly frail, and much to the shock of the officers, some of them were actually adults, with the oldest being 29 years old, though had been mistakenly believed to be a child, as they had weighed only 89 pounds, oh due to the fact that the children were only allowed to eat a small amount just once per day. The children were all covered in bruises, which had come from the constant beatings from their parents, while also being covered in filth, as individually, the kids were only allowed one shower. Not per day, and not per week, but per year. Are you fucking kidding? The use that had gone on in the Turpin family home, at the hands of both Luis and David, was truly unthinkable, with perhaps the most egregious crime being committed by Luis, as on many occasions, she was said to have prostituted multiple of her children oh, to wealthy men, and all in order to earn more money for the family while the couple otherwise kept the children locked within the home for the entirety of their lives, torturing them beyond belief, despite the fact that on social media, they would post photos portraying them as a perfect loving unit. That is disgusting. Which leads me back to the trail of videos oh. left behind on YouTube. For starters, you may be wondering how these children were able to attend these wedding ceremonies if they were truly never allowed to leave the house. Well, these clips actually show what may very well be the only times in these kids' lives that they were ever allowed to leave their home, oh as God. once a year they were allowed to go to this ceremony, not as a reward or anything like that, but to disguise the Turpins as being a happy family. Yeah, this just to use all the pictures and video and everything as just, you know, more proof nothing crazy is going on and everything's all well. That is disgusting, man. What's scary though, and you know, she was able to upload to YouTube, right? And able to, you know, post some videos of her, you know, singing. You know those shackles are, those invisible shackles are so strong because right there you could get a clear, you have access to get help, right? Or scream or say anything, but it's the fear that, that makes you not say anything. The parents, Marcelino Olgan and Rosa Olgan, along with their son, Lenny, are all facing over a dozen charges, including child cruelty, witness intimidation, and false imprisonment. And making matters even more demented is the fact that the father, Marcelino, was additionally charged with performing lewd acts on a minor as it's been alleged that he actually molested two of the children. And I hate to leave this video off on such an awful note, so I do want to say that some of the Turpin yeah. children have gone on to live their own lives, that thankfully have been free of abuse, as Jordan herself has actually become a star on TikTok and is clearly her. thriving given her newfound freedom. Good for her. She's so beautiful. it isn't Good all for her. horribly depressing. Good, Good for her, dude. And she lives, she's beautiful. That's awesome. I want to give a huge thank you to my patrons. Alexander Duran, America's Grumpy Uncle, Bazoo42, Biznacker, Break. Does it again. What another great video by Nick Crowley. Survivor.